Hi there, Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter. I want to ask you a question. What do you want to paint? What do you feel like painting? When you grab your supplies and sit down and look at that blank piece of paper, what is it that excites you? I love painting food. That's, I don't know why exactly. Um, I don't even have a sweet tooth, but I really enjoy painting pastries and confections. And, um, and I was, uh, as I've mentioned before, Back January, February, I was suffering quite a an art block and um, I was sitting down to paint one day and I'm just like, I feel like painting donuts. And that's what I did. And so I started off with this water soluble pencil. This is a Derwent graphite tint. It's in a, a brown shade, which is it's a water soluble graphite, but it has a color to it as well. And I thought I'm going to sketch with this on watercolor paper. I didn't really have any exp uh, expectations of the painting. Um, but I wanted to sketch with this because it will, it was pretty close to the native color of the donuts. It kind of being like a, almost like a ambery brown color. And also as I applied watercolor over top, it would dissolve. So I wouldn't be in, I wouldn't end up with any uh, pencil marks that I had to deal with. So this method, these supplies gave me a certain freedom to kind of jump right in with this um, with this subject matter and start painting. I didn't have to worry about erasing, um, and I was just feeling very free to uh, to sketch with this. This wasn't for any particular need. I wasn't um, drawing this because I intended to do a tutorial or I needed it for a class or um, or a client or anything. I just was doing this for fun. Actually, this was kind of like a warm up for the gummy bear piece that I uh, did recently as well. So I knew the gummy bear piece was going to take a while. So I thought, well, I'm going to get this one started and get a background in and that way um, I'll have something I can bounce over to when I'm finished the gummy bear piece or if I want to take a break. I find it's it's nice to work on multiple pieces of artwork at the same time because then um, if you get stuck on one piece you can jump over to the other one and also it keeps that kind of sense of novelty around. Um, if you've got a piece you're kind of experimenting with you're not really that um, married to, uh, you can kind of bounce back and forth and not have that like heavy expectation of it has to be great, it has to be perfect. Now as I start to, uh, now that I've laid out all the donuts and I've got a good idea of how they're going to balance out, now I can darken some of my lines and I can also add some details like the uh, drippy glaze on the chocolate donuts and the icing on the strawberry donut and um, the icing on the bottom donut that's going to have sprinkles on it. It's um, it's just a, it's it's nice. Once you get those basic shapes down, you can go ahead and and add in um, add in a little bit more detail. And still, all the time you're knowing that these lines will be washed away once you add water. So it's um, it's nice. I don't know if I necessarily recommend sketching with a water soluble pencil if it's something where you need to keep really detailed um, lines throughout your painting because they will wash away. But something that's simple that doesn't have to be exact is perfect for this. Like you know, you can do a flower or um, or a landscape or you know some sweets, something like that. If you're going to do a portrait, you might want to actually sketch it on another piece of paper and then transfer the good lines over just to make sure you have lines that won't dissolve and that are really accurate. But for something like this, um, it's just the perfect way to approach it. Like I said, I wanted to have the background in and dry uh, before I started the other painting I was working on simultaneously. So I wet the background, at least the bottom part of the background of this painting, and then I mixed up some ultramarine blue and burnt sienna on my uh, palette there to make a nice granulating gray for the shadow. I love a nice um, shadow with some texture in it. And I'm adding that in and letting the colors just kind of uh, spread around there. Now the watercolor paints I have on my table are by Da Vinci. I thought I would do this whole piece in Da Vinci watercolors um, kind of been I've been working on a review of those paints for a while um, I just I so I've been kind of using them a little bit more in the general rotation just so I get a better feel for them um, I really should just buckle down and record that review because I'm, I'm pretty comfortable and familiar with Da Vinci paints because I've been using them for years but in the skinnier palette I've got Denise's um, Earth Friendly palette there that um, I also was trying colors from. Um, I've just been very scattered lately and having a hard time focusing. So um, you'll see, I actually pull in this other palette. This is a uh, Supervision palette. It was kind of um, uh, impulse buy on Amazon. It was a set of 18 colors and um, the it was $35, but then there was a 50% off coupon on top. So it was 
18 professional colors for like $18. I probably should have, I probably should have bought more, but then again, it's like, I've got so much. I don't need more, but I, I bought it as, um, as a backup because I have one of their pan sets and uh, it's a set of 24 pan colors. And I thought the colors might be mostly the same. Some are the same, some aren't, but um, I really enjoyed that set. So I thought I would get that for refills or just for backups. I don't know. I must've been in a scarcity mindset because I bought that paint, but I just couldn't resist that the price um, I thought $35 was a great price for 18. Uh, I think it was eight ML tubes, but then just to see that another 50% off, uh, I snagged it up. They didn't have too many at that price. I think they were just kind of clearing the shelves. I know a lot of, um, a lot of sellers on Amazon, once their stock gets low or if they're rebranding or whatnot, they will just make the stuff super cheap and just get rid of it so they can make room for their next, their next, um, their next set of supplies. Now I need to uh, I need to explain some noise in the background. My dog is uh, hearing the snow come off the roof, and so she's kind of um, kind of like uh, crawling around my feet right now as I'm recording. Kind of nervous about the uh, the snow. So if you hear any weird scratching or tip tapping of dog claws, that's what that is. But anyway, I'm using these uh, really poppy bright colors from the. Um, uh, from that supervision set in the background a bit too. I love the um, yellow ochre as it's a bright yellow, but it's also kind of earthy. But then you've got these beautiful like kind of quinacridone opera pinks and then some beautiful like uh, like aqua teals. And I just think those really have that kind of donut shop vibe that I wanted to get with this piece. I'm not worried about the paint being like... Um, I'm not worried about light fastness with this piece. I'm just like, this is a, this is definitely just kind of like um, an inspiration piece. I want to kind of um, break out of the doldrums and have some fun and use these colors that I love and uh, really not worry about too much. I love to spatter color into my backgrounds uh, while they're still wet. It just gives this kind of dreamy, almost bokeh effect. And um, it's a great way to make this blurry background with lots of color, with lots of texture, but it's not an overpowering texture or pattern or anything it's going to just um it's going to enhance the donuts basically and the other thing I like about a background is that when I have a background and I don't have to worry about keeping my background pristinely white I, I'm not a big fan personally of a white background I like to have I like to have stuff I like to have a background I like stuff going on in it and I love to do my backgrounds first um because if you do your backgrounds after the fact then oftentimes you have to go in and readjust all of the values in your subject matter if you put the backgrounds in first and you save yourself all of that work so that's something that um that i usually do now you can see i did keep the donuts dry so i'm going around it which can give it kind of a cut and paste look um but because i use water soluble media to sketch the donuts in that's why i just wet the background if i wet the entire thing i would erase my drawing essentially and i wouldn't be able to see where my subject is so you know it depends generally if i'm like sketching with a color pencil or a, a graphite pencil or i'm transferring a drawing with graphite paper then i will just wet the entire thing and I'll go in with water. Sometimes I'll wet the front and the back of the paper. So uh, that controls how much spread of color I get. And then I'll just kind of add the color where I want it. And it will just gently float in along the edges. And that keeps me from having a really sharp, like uh, cut and paste collage look. But, um, but with this, it's actually, it's going to work out fine. It's going to work out fine. Um, and it's going to keep the colors really bright on the donuts. But basically, I just wanted to just really play with the background, have fun, get those colors in. And the other thing about doing your background first is that um, if you mess it up, then you haven't like messed up your painting at the last stage of it after you put in all of the work. I'm only, you know, nine minutes in on this painting real time, sketching and everything. So if something goes terribly wrong, I can, I can bail on it and I'm not out that much time. So keep that in mind when you are putting your paintings together. I let the background dry and now I'm going to do the local color layer. So what this is, is the, um, uh, kind of the overall tone of each of the donuts so I'm doing this kind of like golden color here for this vanilla donut on the bottom and um, it just depends on how large you're gonna of an area you're trying to cover whether you pre-wet it or not um, you can even like I could pre-wet it with this yellow ochre color and then drip in some darker colors to get a little bit of a uh, gentle shading and depth you know without a lot of work so that's just something that um, that you want to think about when you're basing in your your different elements in your painting. I like to work in layers because I feel like it gives me a lot of richness in the design. 
to avoid the dreaded cut and paste look that I cannot stand <laughs> in my paintings, I'll use a scrubber brush to go in and soften those edges. This one is by Royal and Langnickel. It's under the Mento watercolor line and it costs like $4. Um, it's available in two or three different sizes. And if you ever see these in a store, I think Joanne carries them. Um, I think Michael's might too. Grab a couple of each size. You will not regret it because they are the best scrubbers. They never damage my paper and they work perfectly. If if you can't find these, my next recommendation would be to go with a golden tacklon filbert, like a quarter inch, um, and try to find ones where the bristles aren't too long from any like acrylic painting um, uh, brush seller, like toll painting, you know. Uh, I'm adding a little bit of brown. I'm using burnt sienna um, to kind of darken the yellow. The yellow ochre wasn't quite dark enough. I decided after further uh, further evaluation, so I'm just going in, adding the yellow ochre. I'm, I'm sorry, the burnt sienna. And I also took a little bit of the ultramarine blue burnt sienna mix and adding that towards the bottom for a little more shadow. And you're constantly evaluating and um, your painting's constantly evolving. Don't be married to anything as you're working in your painting. If you see your colors are off, then adjust. If they need to be darker, go darker. If they need to be lighter, you can either blot. If your paint's still wet, or you can scrub it up with one of those scrubber brushes and you'll be good to go. Uh, avoid the scrubber brushes that have the stiff white nylon bristles. I see those a lot and those will tear up your paper. So you just definitely want something that's a little soft, but firm, and they're gonna work really well for you. I did that same technique on the donut right above and now I'm going on to the top donut and I'm going in with a little bit lighter of a vanilla cake. So um, for this one, I am just kind of loading my brush up really well and that's enough to fill in that donut area. Now when you're doing this type of kind of uh, wet wash, you wanna make sure you skip around a bit so that you're not painting right up against something else that is still wet. Otherwise, you're gonna end up um, having those colors bleed in together. You can see that I'm going in and uh, um, kind of scrubbing edges still here and there. If I see that there's a uh, there's a spot that's too that's too rough, and um, yeah, I'm just just basically filling in with those local colors here. I still like to have a two tone type of effect on these uh, pastries because the most you can, the more you can do in this initial wash of color, um, it's going to save you a lot of time down the road. Get that get that kind of get as much dimension and shading in as you can on this first layer, and you'll be really glad once you go into the um, the kind of detail layers later on. I'm adding some of the detail in the little, um, it almost reminds me of a crawler, that kind of like almost braid um, effect that the um, that this next donut has. I'm going in and I'm putting in my darkest shadow and that's gonna kind of sculpt the, um, the donut. And I'm putting this on first because I don't want it to be really strong. And if I go in and put these details in first and then I wash over it with a yellow ochre color, then it's gonna soften up those shadows. So I just want this to be kind of like the subtle, sculpting of this donut here. And I really like the shape and the volume that it has. So this is really fun. I love to do stuff like this and also like um, icing that's been piped, piped icing that's got like the fluted um, texture to it. So uh, this is a real treat for me to paint. The highlight in the chocolate glazed donut looked really blue. It must have been whatever, like it must have had some outside light or something on it. So I'm actually base coating that in. I'm gonna do an underpainting with that really bright, um, grayish blue color, I don't know if it's bright, but light grayish blue color. Um, I think that's gonna look really good reflecting on the chocolate. And um, I just wanna get that in right off the bat. It's one of those things where if I don't get it in now, I'm gonna have to scrub it out later and it's probably gonna look kind of awkward. I still wanna get a full base coat of something on the icing though. So I made a really dark brown using a uh, brown, either a burnt umber, or I think it was burnt umber, and ultramarine blue. And I'm going in kind of around that highlight area and just kind of letting them blush together a little bit. That way when I go in with a really hard, dark um, overlay to make it look shiny, I'll have something underneath that will um, look like it's getting a little bit of a bounced reflection on it. So just kind of get a, get paint on everything, um, except for like your brightest whites. So you're just trying to um, get that first layer down here. I will have the reference photo I used from unsplash.com linked down below in the video description. So you can open up that picture and you can look and see all the details that uh, you're seeing me paint here. Um, rather than putting it on screen, that way you can also see my palette and whatnot when we're working. So you may be thinking, Lindsay, how come you're covering up all that blue that you put down for the highlight? And, um, 
I'm not covering it all up, but um, it is, it's just like a really subtle, like bounced highlight. It's not even like a really shiny highlight. So I just need to get a little of that essence there, but I don't want it like bright blue. You know what I mean? Hope that makes sense. Um, I'm taking some of the palette dirt to get a little bit of tone onto the the white icing that's on the bottom donut. So it is a white icing. So that would kind of be like almost layer one would be white of the paper, but I knew that was going to look like cut and pasted. I don't like that look. It wasn't going to look natural. So I'm going in with just, just kind of like some palette mud to, um, uh, to, to make it look a little bit more realistic. You know, if you have, if you take a picture of something white, it's not going to be bright white. It's going to be in shadow. It's going to be affected by other things that are around it. Other things casting shadows on it, like the donuts above and, um, highlights bouncing and, and colors that are being reflected and all of that. So I wanted to make sure I didn't just have a stark white there and that I had, a little bit of tone and that I had a little bit of shadow that was um, coming from the donut up above. I also want to take some of that color which is kind of like a neutral gray and paint the uh, shadows in the um, piped icing at the top. Like I mentioned before I love doing textured icing, textured dough, that sort of thing. Um, especially frosting. I love to paint frosting. So I'm just going in there and putting in those shadows. It's one of those things that's a lot easier than you might think it is. Um, you know, it's usually just some pretty crisp few light shadows and that's all you need to do. So, um, and again, I'm, I'm bouncing around because I don't want my paint to flow from donut to donut. So I just kind of skip around. It's kind of like if you had several paintings you were working on at once and when one was drying, you went and worked on another one. It's the same concept here. So, um, so yeah, no, you can do that as well. I'll do that a lot of times with like um, floral paintings, especially if I'm doing loose florals. I'll have like, I'll cut down four pieces of paper and I'll start with one and I'll just kind of um, bounce around and, you know, and then like kind of go in, in stages and then I have like six paintings done all at once. It's kind of fun. I'm using some yellow ochre and a round brush and just kind of dabbing on, I think it's chopped nuts that are on that top that top donut. I'm putting that in before I do the icing just because the icing is going to be pink and I don't want to, um, I don't want the yellow ochre to make it look, make the nuts look orange basically. So here I'm giving everything a nice dry with my heat tool because I want that, I, I don't want to have my colors flow together and I do want to go put the um, glaze on that, that kind of crawler fluted type donut that we colored earlier. As I'm putting in this wash, I am doing something a little bit different on this donut. I'm actually leaving the brightest areas alone. This I'm like painting this donut backwards compared to how I'm doing all the other ones. So we started off with the darkest shadows, then I'm going in with the midtones right now, and then I will do a light wash over everything at the end. So uh, it's some, you know, it just depends. I think because this is so sculptural, this is kind of like how I would paint a. Um, like a stone sculpture or something, I would kind of I work in that way. So if I if I want to get something that has that almost carved appearance, that's that's how I do that. So try that, try that, try both ways. Try painting this donut by putting a light wash and then going light to dark. Try it doing dark to light and see what you like better. And I find that I'm, I switch it around. I switch it around depending on what I'm painting and how smooth I want it to look and um, and what else. Like I don't want a really crisp shiny effect on this donut. So that's why I'm doing it this way. I do want a shiny effect on the chocolate glaze on the donut right below it. So I want that first layer really smooth and then I'll do a hard edge um, shadow afterwards. So, you know, playing with the, with how wet your paint is, how wet your paper is, um, how sheer your paint is. There's so many different variables that will give you a plethora of different effects. And that's, that's where the fun is. The fun is, um, is discovering those, those things and playing with the media. And, uh, I think watercolor is the easiest media to get into, but the hardest media to master. And because of that, it's such a wonderful medium that captivates us and um, romances us for decades and decades and decades. Even I feel like anybody that gets into watercolor, even they might even have some flings with some other mediums, but you probably come back to watercolor if you've ever really gotten into it because there's just something magic about it. It is magic. It's magic if you are someone who likes to let the medium have some agency, um, who likes to lose control a bit, this is the medium for you, I think. 
I'm moving on to the pink icing that's on the top donut, and I'm using a combination of the coral that's in the Supervision palette, the top, um, oh, the top left-hand corner, and then the opera that's about um, four or three spots over there in the palette. I'm mixing them together for this kind of, um, I don't know what to call that, but it's kind of like a vibrant coral, maybe? It's kind of, um, it's kind of fresh, it's kind of light. It's just kind of a nice, um, it's a nice pink that's not too pepto bismol -y because of the orange undertones and that and that coral color. I think I was really charmed by this supervision arrangement of colors, this this uh this set of colors because of some of the uh pastel tones, the the coral, the lavender, the aqua, like kind of seafoam green aqua color. Those I thought were really um were really unique. I don't think I have them in other sets. I might have them in like um, or similar colors in the Shinhan set, but I don't know. I just thought that arrangement was really charming, and um, plus the price, I just couldn't, uh, I couldn't pass it up. Let me know if you'd like a review on those. I wasn't going to review them if they didn't come back in stock, just because. Um, I think it would be super frustrating to hear about some wonderful paints that were a wonderful price that you can't buy because even the regular price on them were very affordable. And I hadn't seen them. I swear I'd seen them at like $65. And then for that, I thought they were kind of expensive for kind of a um, not really, I would say high-end brand. I guess they're not a very well-known brand. I thought that was kind of high, but then it was like 35 Then it was 18 It was like, okay, I will bite. I will give that a try. But uh, so I've been kind of watching to see if they come back in stock and if they do, if they're a reasonable price before I decide if I want to review them or not. But I am enjoying them and I have no qualms uh, about them at all. I think some of the colors are not light fast in this set. I mean, you're going to see that along any art supply realm, any any line of, line of art supplies. Your opera is not going to be light fast. There's going to be colors that are not light fast. Um, so that doesn't necessarily bother me. But the fact that you have to buy them in a set uh, if you're shopping, you know, on Amazon, you can't just buy the tubes that you want. So because of that, then I am a little bit more critical because I know a lot of people do not want to buy the like the fugitive colors. But if you're getting a set and you're and you're forced to buy them if you want the other colors, then you know that just kind of negatively weigh my reviews a little bit. Um, you know, if you're just going tube by tube, like I suppose you probably could buy those on AliExpress tube by tube. Um, I'm pretty sure you can actually, but. Um, I personally don't shop on AliExpress. I've had some of their, uh, some people that sell on AliExpress send me pencils and stuff like that to review, but I've never actually shopped there myself. So I've also, you know, I always want to make that clear because, I mean, I don't know. I know a lot of people do and have great luck with it. I just, I just haven't myself. Um, now here I'm putting in the sprinkles, which I think look nice over that toned background that I put because I feel it's much more natural looking than leaving it like bright glaring white. Um, so that's why I did that. It just gives you a little bit more weight and depth and volume. And that's really what you want on these um, sweets so they don't look flat. Anytime you've got kind of those poppy colors, they could they have a, they run the, the risk of looking um, kind of uh, like a graphic design as opposed to a painting. One of these days, I'm going to collect all of my paintings of food, I think, and frame them and put them in my kitchen. I always love the uh, 50s diner aesthetic. And we have a, we put a black and white um, checkered floor in our kitchen a few years ago, and I was thinking oh, it would be so cool to do like uh, uh, to do kind of um, bubblegum pink walls and um, black cabinets and white countertop. We have white countertop already, but I just thought that would be so cool because our appliances are white. Just do that whole black, white, and pink. But I cannot convince Mr. Frugal to go for the pink walls. Let me know. Do you guys have any tips? How do you convince your husband to go for a bright pink wall? I've been trying to get pink walls since we bought this house. In fact, um, I kind of went rogue and we were buying paint and we agreed on some color. And then I just went up to walked up to the counter and I said, I want this pink. <laughs> and I brought it home and he's like, we're not painting our kitchen that. I had to tint the paint because paint was expensive. So I had to find like some other paint that we had to like tint it. And I ended up making it orange. Oh, it was like pumpkin orange. And so we painted the kitchen that color and it was so obnoxious. And so I'm like, well, I know I'm going to do a faux finish. And this is like back in the late 90s when like faux finishing was all the rage. And so we got this, uh, I got this brown paint. I don't even know what it came from, what it was. It was left over from something. And we got some plastic bags and we like, and I mixed some glazing medium in it because I had glazing medium left over from the living room, which we had um, kind of like avocado uh, color walls with a, um, a yellowish, uh, it sounds gross, but it, trust me, it was beautiful. Um, like a plastic bag 
you know, you take the plastic bag and you dip it in the paint. You or you know you brush on the paint with a glazing medium and then you dab it off with the plastic bag. It looked great. It was fantastic. So I'm like, I'm gonna do that in the kitchen. It looks so. <laughs> It was so bad. Oh my word. It was so hideous. It was like, I don't know, a Burger King restaurant gone wrong. It was so bad. It didn't stay that way too long before we painted it apple green, which was a nice color. It's kind of like that Granny Smith apple color. Uh, it's like a Caribbean blue now, but man, I've always wanted the pink kitchen. Maybe someday, someday I'll come around. Uh, <laughs> but wouldn't that look great? Just like black, white, and pink. I also like red. Actually, I really love a cranberry red kitchen, but red is so difficult to paint. It takes so many coats. So I don't know. I'm up in the air. You can let me know what you think in the comments below. What color should I paint my kitchen? Keep in mind, it's also like, it's the same wall. Like it goes down to a hallway. So like there's no good delineation point for my kitchen to all the way down the hallway. So I kind of would color whatever I did in the kitchen. I'd probably take it all the way down the hallway because there's no good place to like stop the color. So right now it's all blue. Uh, it's not a bad color. It's just, you know, I'm ready for a change. You know, there's probably dried SpaghettiOs somewhere in the kitchen because the kids were, it's been that color for like over 10 years, which is a long time for me. Anyway, uh, so now we're going on to our next layer on these donuts. You saw with the sprinkles, I guess the sprinkles could have been called the layer. I don't know. Um, I'm putting in some texture, I'm darkening up like the bottom of the donut there, that, that lower donut, adding the shadow around the edges. That's going to give it a little bit more of a roundness. So anytime you have something round, like a cylinder or a ball or a plant pot or a coffee mug, if you add a little shading to the edges, it will make the, um, it'll make the object have a little bit more volume. Okay. Uh, especially when you're doing a still life, oftentimes you'll have a couple lighting sources. Uh, but generally when you're like lighting a still life, you are going to have some sort of front light. It's probably, it's not going to be directly in front. Generally, it usually be on the edge or like a little bit to the edge. So you might have more shadow on one side than the other, like the bottom one had the bottom donut, you know, that they have more shadow on the left than the right, but it's going to be hitting the center of your objects, usually in a kind of typical lighting situation. So you will have, uh, have the shadows kind of falling off the edge and making the, um, the object appear more voluminous. Now here I am going in with a really dark shadow. I am using, um, ultramarine blue and burnt umber again, making that black. Uh, I try to just recycle the colors as much as possible in any painting, even if it's something with lots of bright colors. I still try to mix my shadows from what I'm using. That creates harmony and um, it makes your painting look more professional. It's, it's when you start grabbing, when you, when you don't mix colors and you just grab the paint from the, uh, the palette indiscriminately, uh, that's where I think your work starts to look amateurish. The um, the only time I would say it doesn't is if you're doing something specifically to make it look very graphic and design oriented, but you're still limit, going to limit your palette. You're not going to use 25 colors. You might stick to like, I don't know, between five and eight colors. And then you would, you know, like the Art Nouveau palette from uh, Gensai Tambi that we were using. That's such a beautiful color palette and they're all kind of bespoke convenience colors. You wouldn't, and they're not the best for mixing. So you would use those colors generally straight from the pan, but you wouldn't be using every single color in the kit. And that's what would keep that from looking garish. Um, so if you find your work is just, you're looking a little amateurish, you're not sure why, it's probably because you're using too many colors and you're not mixing enough. So can you see now how shiny the donut's starting to look because I have those hard edges? And you can still see that the, that hint of blue that we did in that wash with the light blue and the brown to begin with. Um, so, I mean, we'll need to put some brighter highlights on that later, but you can see how it's really got that kind of like um, that shiny effect. Like there's a little bit of light bouncing onto that. Not a, We don't have the direct highlight on there yet, but it's got, um, it's got like a bounced highlight and you've got the shadow and that's giving it that gloss. I like to let my paint flow together. So I put that light kind of yellow ochre color at the top of that cherry. And then I'm going to charge in, um, you know, some reds and corals and just kind of let the paint do its thing. I find that gives me a really natural look and um, is a little more exciting than painting something just a flat color. I didn't want that red to stand out like a sore thumb, so I'm adding some sprinkles in that same color onto that bottom donut to tie it all together and make sure I have harmony throughout the piece. 
One thing I really enjoy is adding colored pencils to my watercolors uh, as a final stage. Now, of course, you don't have to do that, or you could even go in with watercolor and add more shading if you want to. The thing I like about it is that colored pencils have a different opacity. They have a different um, texture, and they can give you some other effects that um, would be quite difficult in watercolor and very time consuming and still would not be exactly the same. I'm using some Prismacolor colored pencils and also just some random wax based pencils that I have um, in a rack by my desk. They're not even the best quality pencils in the world, but they do the trick for this kind of final tweaking of colors. So I will use a colored pencil if I need to add some depth. I will use a colored pencil if I want to add some highlight. I will use a sharp colored pencil if I need to make an edge a little more crisp. Um, it's a great way to, like if your paint skipped or maybe you have that, a rough edge that looks kind of cut and pasted. You know how I hate the cut and pasted look in my watercolors. Um, I can go in and I can soften an edge uh, with a colored pencil, usually doing a shade lighter, just kind of um, uh, soften edges and blend them together. They're really, it's really a, a very, very versatile tool. It can save you a lot of time. So if you're doing some artwork that is, um, say I'm doing artwork for a client and it's just, they, they just care about the final product. They don't care about what products I've used. It's a great way to save time. You know, I can do all the washes in watercolor and then I can go in with colored pencil. You can do the same thing with markers. You can do the, you know, your, your top, your bottom layers with marker and then go in with colored pencil. Because colored pencil, the wax-based colored pencils, and by wax-based colored pencils, I would say like Prismacolor Premier colored pencils, uh, Derwent Colorsoft, Derwent Chromaflow, those three are, and uh, Derwent Lightfast as well, those are probably my favorite Actually, Derwent Lightfast is oil-based, but it does have a little bit of opacity to it. But actually, you know what I would say if you're not worried about light fastness, I would say Prismacolor Premier, Derwent Color Soft, and Derwent Chroma Flow, they're very opaque pencils and they're very soft and they lay down on top of watercolor and on top of marker so beautifully because they have a bit of opacity. But they're not completely opaque. You can still see what's underneath, um, especially with your deeper colors. And uh, I just think it's great. Now, if I want to get the texture, that cakey texture of a donut where it's got kind of like little pox and little a roughness texture, you do that with the edge of the pencil. It's such a wonderfully easy way to get that. And it's such an effective way to get that texture in your artwork. Um, and yes, you totally could do this in 100% watercolor and stipple and do all sorts of techniques like that. And if that's what you want to do, go for it. For me, art is about... Um, expression, enjoyment. I want to um, create how I want to create. And I don't really care very much about following the rules. As long as my artwork is not going to fall apart, I'm fine with using mixed media to get the effect that I want on the paper. I worked on this piece over the course of a couple of days, but I did keep the video in real time so you'd have a good idea about how long this took in real time. Um, so if you noticed any lighting discrepancies, it's because I got a new lamp in my studio and I think I have a little too much light on my table at the moment. So I do apologize if any of this looks a little bit blown out, but I do hope that you have uh, opened up this donut reference photo on your computer, maybe printed it out and uh, have painted along. Obviously you could pause whenever you need to. I know some people like to watch it all the way through and then go ahead and paint it themselves. You can pause whenever you need to. Um, you can always slow it down or speed it up using the gear on the YouTube video player. But um, yeah, hopefully it gave you a good idea of the steps that I use to create my food paintings, especially sweets and pastries. And I hope it inspires you to try some of that as well. And still, you can see, I will keep layering up and just very, very lightly. I'm hardly putting any media down. I'm just kind of just grazing the edge of that lead onto the um, onto the rough surface of my paper. And I believe this paper I'm using is um, Hanamule Cold Press Cezanne paper, which I'm not sure if that is still around anymore. Now, I thought that that texture looked a little too aggressive here so I'm going over with this really really pale kind of cream golden cream color can't remember the name of it honestly 
I don't know my pencils by name because the printing is so small on them. I just grab what looks like is going to work and I'll do like, I just look at the lead. I'll look at the barrel to kind of get an idea of what pencil I want. And then I look at the leads to pick out the exact tone that I want. And I'm also highlighting the nuts on top of the top donut with that really light pencil. Now, do you see how I turn the pencil? The reason I do that is because it helps keep the the, tar the tip sharp. I don't like to sharpen my pencils too is more often than I need to because it wastes the lead. So I just rotate my pencil as I go and that keeps the tip of the pencil sharp because sometimes I want that blunt tip on a pencil. Like if I'm kind of scumbling or doing another texture effect or I want to like really uh, add a thick passage of color somewhere. I wouldn't really want a sharp pencil. So I try to do that, try to conserve my lead a little bit. Prismacolor pencils are not terribly expensive, but um, I still I still try not to waste because, you know, it's a hassle. It's a hassle to run out in the middle of a project, right? Or to have to, you know, run out and place an order if you don't already have a bunch of things that you need to get anyway. Now, I like to do the same texture techniques to everything. That way, um, I don't end up with one donut looking really finished and another donut looking really smooth. And now I'm gonna use my white Prismacolor pencil to go in and throw some of the highlights onto this shiny donut here. I did stop and sharpen my pencil because uh, it was super blunt and uh, I wasn't able to get the detail that I wanted. Uh, so what I'll do is if I sharpen the pencil, if I need that super sharp point, I will skip around and I will do the really skinny highlights. Okay, so you saw that I was working on that donut. I was I put in a couple of the, the wider highlights and then I'm like, oh, this needs to be sharpened. I sharpened it. Then I went up to the cherry where I wanted that skinny highlight. And um, I'm going up to this uh, the icing on the top, the pink icing where I need the skinny highlight. And then as the pencil wears down to the bluntness that I need, then I'll go back to the donut and put that width of line that I need. I hope that makes sense. It probably sounds kind of silly and it's something I didn't even realize I did until watching this footage back again. It's very um, it's very interesting for me to do a voiceover after the fact. Interesting in the way that I usually typically try to avoid it because I find it a little boring. It's interested in that boring way, but then I see myself do something that I wasn't even aware that I do and I'm cleaning up the edges on the bottom uh, donuts icing as well. And now I'm using the white to do some texture. I'm using the edge of the pencil and getting some um, some highlight there. Now that's a technique I can do when I need to sharpen my pencil a little bit because if I do that on the edge and I turn my pencil as I go, I'm going to sharpen that. It's going to sharpen that pencil. It's going to wear it back into a point again. So um, that's how I conserve my lead. That's why I don't have to replace my pencils too often. Now, that said, I do order my white Prismacolor pencils by the box. And white Prismacolor is probably my most used colored pencil white. Derwent drawing Chinese white is also really good and opaque. It's not quite as soft as the Prismacolor. Uh, so I just tend to get Prismacolor, plus they're way cheaper. Um, so I can get a box of 12 Prismacolor for about 12 bucks or less. So that's why I do that. It's just very reliable and I'm used to it. Derwent Chinese white pencil is a better pencil. I can say objectively it is a, it is a better pencil. The lead is thicker. It's less likely to break, but um, the, the Prismacolor is quite a bit cheaper and, and easier to get in a box 12. So that's why I do that. But you could do either. Honestly, it does not matter one single bit. I've been using Prismacolor since I was five. So, you know, old habits. Uh, and I'm going in, I thought some of my highlights looked a little harsh on that kind of crawler style twist there. So I'm going in and um, blending those out a little bit using the edge of that creamy looking pencil. I think it might be called Sable and I'm not sure if it's still a, yeah, it must be. These all must be, except for a couple of purples that I have in my stash are all current colors. Um, but yeah, it's just, a, it's just a matter of kind of tweaking and going through and adjusting at this point. I thought the shadow and the pit of the cherry needed to be a little bit darker. So I'm going in with a raspberry pencil. I'm adding um, it to the the uh, sides and the bottom and the hole, the pit there. And now I'm actually going in with a little bit of black because I have used black elsewhere. I did use it in some of the shadows. So I'm going to go it up, put it up there as well because that is also a really dark area where you have those occlusional shadows. That's where two items touch. That's always going to be your darkest area where two, where an item touches another item or an item touches a surface. That's where you're going to get that really, really dark color. Now here I have poppy red, I believe, and I'm bridging the raspberry to the kind of corally color of the watercolor color that I have on the cherry just to kind of give it a little more punch a little more roundness and um, a little bit more depth of color and uh, then I'm going in with a brighter uh, more corally red there just to help uh, 
you know, help brighten it a little bit too. So, I mean, the, the goal isn't to cover up everything you've done in watercolor, but if you do need to, you certainly can. So to protect this painting, what I would do is I would cut a mat and I would put it in a frame under glass or under plexiglass, and that's going to keep it pretty safe. If I'm worried about the light fastness of the colors, I could use a UV glass or I can use a plexiglass. Plexiglass, which is a, like an acrylic glazing, that does offer more sun light fat light fast protection than glass does um, but you have the you know you just got to know that it is more prone to scratching so as long as uh as long as it's not in an area where it's going to need to be aggressively cleaned or get aggressively harmed then you should be all right either way and now our favorite part take the tape off and get to see our beautiful white frame i love doing that even though this tape was really low tack and wouldn't really stick it down to my clipboard very well um, there we get to see the finished picture uh, i'll put a still photo up for you to see as well and i want to thank you so much for watching today if you have any questions go ahead and put them in the comments below i will link up the supplies i used if i can find them and the reference photo as well thank you so much for watching and until next time happy crafting